Hello, I'm Martin Farr, co-chair of Insights Public Lectures. Welcome to the latest in our Insights Revisited series, where we look back on highlights of the programme. One of the biggest highlights I can recall from my time with Insights was in January 2018, when we hosted the Speaker of the House of Commons to open that semester's programme. We have had big lectures in the past, where overspill rooms were used. Uh, there's always one overspill room for every lecture, which has live video and audio. On this occasion, we booked the three lecture theatres in the Curtis Auditorium, along from the Curtis Auditorium in the Herschel Building, expecting a large audience. And in fact, we were inundated. And for the first and only time, we had to close the building and queues snaked off into the dark of a very cold winter's evening. All of this testified to the enormous curiosity and appeal of seeing the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko, who had, more than any other speaker, elevated the role into a public one. And much of the appeal, I think, of people coming was to see a television celebrity, one who would be prominent in any era, but in the parliamentary consequences of the 2016 referendum on UK membership of the EU, the Brexit debate more broadly, his position was even more prominent. And indeed, in the months after he spoke at Newcastle, and particularly last year, in 2019, as we approached the general election, he became an extremely divisive figure in the very divisive debate about enacting the will of the public in the referendum. But through Parliament, his role was quite important and it became probably for the first time a political rather than a procedural office and it was a singular speakership he was a singular speaker and i think that's why there was so much interest in him coming to speak as you'll hear it was a bravura performance delivered without notes and his evident enjoyment of engaging with the public was one of my most vivid memories he had endless patience for selfies with members of the audience long after the lecture finished and clearly enjoyed engaging with the public. And indeed, I think history will record him as having transformed the office of the speaker into something of an ambassador for Parliament more generally and seeing himself as somebody who felt his role to be engaging with a much wider public than the House of Commons perhaps would historically have thought appropriate. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much, Martin. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all to Newcastle University this evening. It's fantastic we've got the largest group we've had in 20 years here tonight. So, absolutely fantastic. And it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, John Burko. Um, was a graduate of Essex University, uh, he graduated in 1985 with a degree in government with a first class honours. He became an MP in 1997, and then I'm sure you're all aware, in 2009 became the 157th Speaker in the House of Commons. Before that, though, he had a number of shadow roles, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury in 2001, Shadow Minister for Work and Pensions in 2002, and from 2003 to 4, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. And in this role of international development, he sat on um, various uh, committees and all parliamentary groups to deal with the challenges around international development. John, in his role as Speaker of the House of Commons, has pushed incredibly hard to make Parliament accessible with outreach events in schools and universities such as the event this evening. He's pushed very hard to make sure we're aware of Parliament and sought to champion the rights of backbenchers and to ensure that parliamentary business is dealt with in a timely manner to ensure as many MPs as possible can contribute. I want to pay John my own vote of thanks for what he did in 2017 around our celebrations around Freedom City 2017 where we commemorated 50 years since Martin Luther King was here 
talking about the challenges of war, poverty, and racism. He was a graduate, an honorary graduate of this university. We had a fantastic event just over a year ago in the state rooms in Parliament. Thank you very much, John, for everything you did on that occasion. John has lots of uh, hobbies. Uh, tennis is one of the biggest ones, and he has actually published a book on tennis maestros, the 20 greatest male tennis players of all time, which was published in 2013. Okay, so it is my genuine, deep, and great pleasure to welcome the Right Honourable John Burko MP to Newcastle University and to speak to us about the Speaker, Parliament, and engaging with modern democracy. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you for the warmth, comprehensiveness and generosity of that introduction to which I don't know whether I'm equal. I can strive only, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, to do my level best, but I am moved on the strength of your generosity to observe at the outset that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> Now, whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is a matter for legitimate speculation and conjecture. No person can be judged in his or her own cause, and I will await your verdict with good grace and an air of uncertain anticipation. Perhaps I can ask at the outset, can you hear me at the back? Yes. That is... An affirmative response accompanied also by one or two, I note, friendly, I shall interpret them in that way, waves. And I must say that having heard that response and been encouraged by it, I note that it represents a marked improvement upon the answer that I recently received elsewhere to the self-same question, can you hear me at the back? The audience contained some unhelpful wag who replied disconcertingly, Yes, but I will happily change places with someone who can't. <laughs> so I'm on to a good footing on the strength of that reception. And I want to say how thrilled and encouraged and indeed inspired I am to be here this evening. It's a great privilege to be invited to participate in, to make a contribution to your public lecture series, and to do so in the company of Richard, Provost Vice Chancellor, responsible for public engagement and internationalisation. That is a big deal, so far as his responsibilities are concerned. We are renewing our acquaintance, forged in Speaker's House, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the conferring of the honorary doctorate upon Martin Luther King. And that event in Speaker's House, ladies and gentlemen, took place on the 16th of January last year. Perhaps not entirely in accord with established protocol, in no spirit of self-service, but rather of enthusiasm born of that event and my experience in hosting it, I volunteered to speak at the university. Ordinarily, I must admit, I don't invite myself. I usually wait to see whether I'm invited, but on that occasion, I was so inspired by the significance of the occasion, the foresight and the apposite quality of the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King 50 years previously, and what it said about the mores of the University of Newcastle, that I thought, well, I haven't been to speak there, I've been to dozens of universities, but not there, and I will make the offer. I did not intend that it should take over a year to honour it, and in case you're one of those mildly anorakish people who has a great interest in detail and minutiae, I can tell you that I think I was originally scheduled to speak at the university on the 25th of May last year in the year of Freedom City, and that would have contained a certain piquancy, certainly from my point of view. Unfortunately, another event <laughs> interceded over which I had no control and which I absolutely admit I myself would not 
have predicted, namely the general election <laughs> campaign. And that is the cause of the significant delay. And you're, putting it another way, being spared for several months this visit. But I'm here now, and I'm delighted to be, and in the presence of the Vice-Chancellor and those who organise Martin and Annie the lecture series and Richard, it is a joy to be so. It is also a joy to be associated with, joined by, and in a position tonight personally to express my admiration for, the Member of Parliament in whose constituency this great university falls and who I have come to know extremely well since May 2010 when she was elected. It may well be, and probably is so, that she, on Wera, regards it as her privilege to represent in Parliament the people of Newcastle Central. But perhaps I can be permitted without presumption to say to you, if you live in the Newcastle Central constituency, that you are extremely fortunate and privileged to be represented by Chi. She is spectacularly assiduous, incredibly well informed about a wide miscellany of different topics, and in an era in which, sadly, science and engineering are still notably, perhaps deplorably, underrepresented amongst the skill sets and background life experience of members of Parliament, she well and truly fills the breach. She speaks with knowledge and authority on those matters, on equality issues, and on a plethora of other subjects to boot. It is, I think, the commonplace and a truism that although a lot of people have a healthy scepticism towards, and even in some cases, a risible distaste for politicians, they very often are willing to make, on the strength of personal knowledge and experience, an exception for their own member of parliament. And in the House of Commons, we often have fun talking to each other about how a constituent has come up to us and said, you do an extremely good job. You're absolutely marvellous. I wrote to you and you came back to me so quickly and you've been very accommodating and you've facilitated a solution or assistance for me. The other lot are absolutely useless, but we're very lucky to have you. But in Newcastle Central's case, you are lucky to have Chi. And I think the constituency is also very proud to have this university, whose recent establishment should not in any sense blind us to or hide us from what is a very real historical lineage. It may only be 55 years since the inception of the modern Newcastle University. That, however, should not be allowed to detract from the fact that it has its roots in the School of Medicine and Surgery as long ago as 1834, and in the College of Physical Science in 1871. So there's a real track record, and there is a track record in more recent decades in this city of recognizing the moral cause of racial equality, and indeed, for that matter, of female emancipation and suffrage. So, I'm thrilled to be with you, and my only other preliminary with which I feel I need to dispense before I treat of my principal theme is one, ladies and gentlemen, quite sensitive matter, which I hazard a guess your natural courtesy will probably disincline you to raise with me directly, but which, if unaddressed, will lurk <coughs> mischievously, apart from my vantage point, perilously in the undergrowth and which I conclude, therefore, must be knocked on the head at the outset before I proceed any further. And that, of course, is the sensitive matter of height. <laughs> Very specifically, it has been bruited in some of the more downmarket parts of the press that I am the shortest man ever to be Speaker of the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. Now, let me say to you with all the rhetorical force and insistence of my command, ladies and gentlemen, 
to admit of no uncertainty and to brook of no contradiction that there is nothing wrong with being short. <laughs> Indeed, although I cannot say it with certainty because you're sitting down, on the law of averages, the great likelihood is that a proportion of you in this audience probably share the characteristic with me of lifelong vertical challenge. <laughs> and what I say to you is we short people should stick together. We may be short, but we may also be, or judge ourselves to be, perfectly formed. In any case, I am probably making a virtue of necessity. The facts are straightforward. I have always been short. Last month I became 55 years old and I remain short. And given the known impact of the aging process upon physiognomy, the overwhelming likelihood is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. And about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, my friends, I am as intensely relaxed as Peter Mandelson once famously, in some people's minds, infamously said, New Labour was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. But I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy would expect the speaker for suit to have done his research. And if in no other respect, I hope at least in that respect not to disappoint you, I have done. And simply as a matter of historical fact, it's quite wrong when some of these more down-market, fifth-rate, low-musical <laughs> scribblers say, oh, well, Burko's the shortest man ever to be speaker in the United Kingdom. Sir John Bussey, <laughs> Speaker of the House. From 1394 to 1398. Sir John Wenlock, Speaker of the House from 1455 to 1456. And Sir Thomas Tresham, we mustn't forget him, Speaker of the House in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am. Although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. <laughs> Indeed, no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's block. One was killed in battle, and a further poor unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. So you will understand that this does enable me to view the ways and challenges which afflict and confront the House of Commons, and which, I readily concede, periodically afflict and confront me with an appropriate sense of historical perspective. That is to say, whatever else happens to me, I am not likely to lose my head. And what I should like to do in talking to you about my role, Parliament, and engagement with modern democracy is to cover a number of key themes, which I think are the sort of central tenets of my speakership, and then to open up to you. My first theme is the role, which is by a huge multiple the best known and most visible role of the speaker, which of course is to chair in the chamber, with which most of you will be personally familiar. It requires, indeed it presupposes or demands, the speaker relinquishing his or her previous party affiliation from the moment of election. This is something that isn't universally understood, as a consequence of which I still meet people who say, well, of course, you're conservative, or you're from this party or that party. The reality is that the House of Commons wants the Speaker to be independent of, unconnected with, dissociated from, expressing no support for and declaring no opposition to any political party. Just to get the point across in terms explicit, the argument is, the idea, the rationale is the speaker has made the journey from being a player on the field to being the referee or umpire of the match. So on the 22nd of June 2009, I resigned my membership of the Conservative Party and I sit as, if you will, a quasi-independent at an election time and this is the corollary of that decision and that status, I stand in Buckingham still as a local MP, as the Speaker seeking re-election, and by convention, though by no requirement of law, the major parties don't stand against the Speaker because they want the Speaker to be re-elected and because they don't want the Speaker to be drawn into partisan controversy. Now, there are arguments about 
absence of party choice as far as Buckingham residents are concerned, or I can discuss that if you're interested to do so, but I would say that it underscores that notion of speaker and partiality, and I'm still perfectly well able to represent my constituents in correspondence with ministers, having meetings with them conducted in speaker's house, in a manner broadly analogous, in fact almost directly comparable, to the way in which ministers represent constituents. Ministers speak in the chamber only from the dispatch box on the Treasury bench in respect of their ministerial duties, not about constituency matters. The speaker speaks in the chamber only from the speaker's chair on speakerly matters and not on anything else. But I represent people in the way that I have described. And in that role, my primary concern is to keep order Encourage people to take part and cut down on the number of people who have to be excluded altogether as a result of bad behaviour. Now, when I stood for election in the immediate aftermath of the reputational carnage inflicted by the expenses scandal, I said to myself and to colleagues, of course we have to allow to be put in the place of a discredited, outdated, excessively secretive, overly generous, patently indefensible expense system, a new set of arrangements configured by an independent body and characterized by equity, audit, transparency and accountability. But if any of my colleagues feels that that's all that's wrong with Parliament, that our expenses system is bust and has caused us to be held in public opprobrium, I think that colleague is mistaken. Indeed, I would go so far as to say deluded on an industrial scale. The real big problem for Parliament at that time was that over a period of at least four decades, the power of government had increased, was continuing to increase, and needed to be reduced. Of which the corollary, my friends, is that the power of Parliament had decreased, was continuing to decrease, and needed to be increased. And I put the thesis to my colleagues that there was a disequilibrium <coughs> in our political system. The executive branch, that is to say the government, had become too powerful, and Parliament had become too weak. Almost, if you will, a rubber stamp for the wishes of the executive of the day. So I said, look, I can't do it all on my own, but there has to be a will in this place. And if there were people coming up to me saying, oh, I'm all in favour of parliamentary independence, John, but I can't speak out about it because I'm parliamentary private secretary to X, or I'm very keen to be appointed a whip, or I'm very desirous of ministerial office. If people really want Parliament to recover, they're going to have to be frank, to get off their knees and to insist upon the reclamation by Parliament of its own core functions. Uh, I said, if you elect me, I intend for a start to speed up question time. Not enough colleagues get a chance to contribute. Questions are too long. Answers are too long. If you elect me, I'll up the tempo, which I have done. Now, whether I'm any good as speaker, not for me to say, that is for you to judge. But I have sought, my friends, to do what he said on the tin, and to say, let's get down the order paper. Let's get people who've been drawn in the ballot into the exchanges, and let us, if necessary, have a speaker who says to a minister delivering an overly long response, perhaps a delaying response, or one that is designed to prevent us making progress, thank you, minister, I'm extremely grateful, but the abridged rather than the War and Peace version would be appreciated. <laughs> and so that is what I've tried to do. I did say to my electorate back in 2009, I think that it is necessary to make the progress, and I won't be able to satisfy everybody. Do I please everybody? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, one of those pigs I see flying in front of my very eyes. I'm going from side to side. I'm calling Conservative and then Labour and the other way around. And people from smaller parties. I'm looking to call women who on the whole are better behaved in Parliament as well as men. I'm looking to call to ask questions or to make speeches, those from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, as well as from England. I'm looking to call people from intakes long ago, 
the most notable of whom is the current father of the house, Ken Clark, elected on the 18th of June 1970 and still in situ without interruption today. But I'm looking to call to speak, to ask questions, to probe, to question, to challenge, to scrutinise the government of the day. Members of Parliament who were elected last June who are also paid by the taxpayer an equal salary and from <coughs> whom their constituents wish to hear. And I will not be able to satisfy everybody, but I really want this to be a less hierarchical place with a greater opportunity for members across the piece to question the government of the day of whatever complexion it happens to be. And for a very long period in our history, that really was all the speaker was expected to do. However, there have been times, as you would know if you've read the historical works of Linda Colley, the British historian, when Parliament has been more active, more assertive, more interrogative, more demanding, more change-orientated, and there have been points at which there has been an expectation and perhaps even a general desire that the speaker should be a catalyst for or a facilitator of necessary, desired, and overdue change. And when I stood for election, I said, look, I think there are a number of things that we've got to focus on here. First of all, it is, in my view, highly undesirable for Parliament that there can be a matter of very, very considerable urgency and perhaps of controversy appertaining to public policy, which can't be raised in the chamber because the government hasn't come to talk about it. And the government basically dominates the order paper. It's a majority force, and it schedules the business. And I said, look, if you elect me, I'm conscious of the standing orders which provide for urgent, capital U, questions, capital Q, and it is the prerogative of the speaker to receive and adjudicate applications for permission urgently to question a minister on an issue that has just arisen, about which, for whatever reason, the minister hasn't volunteered to come to make an oral statement to the House. And I said, colleagues, if you elect me, I am absolutely determined that urgent matters will be treated as urgent and can be urgently raised in the chamber, whether the government of the day particularly likes it or not. In the year before I was elected speaker, there were two urgent questions all year. In my first year, there were 24. And over the eight and a half years I've served as speaker to date, we have had 425 urgent questions. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the Speaker saying the government is wrong on the issue. It's not the Speaker saying the government is right on the issue. It's not the Speaker expressing a view about the merits or demerits of public policy on the issue at all, for that is not the domain of the Speaker. It is the Speaker saying, this is a matter that warrants the attention of the House of Commons today. For a minimum of 20 minutes, and sometimes 30, 40 minutes, or even perhaps up to, exceptionally, an hour. And my sense is that colleagues and serious commentators on Parliament regard it as a positive that we have far more urgent questions in the Chamber. It has, to some degree, revitalised the Chamber, investing it with an urgency, a topicality, an unpredictability, sometimes even a tension and an excitement, that the other two were lacking. It gives an opportunity for a backbench member. It acts as a magnet to the chamber rather than a source of repelling people away from it. Instead of a member thinking, oh, stop it. I might as well go and write a newspaper article, do a radio interview, go to a television studio to raise this issue. The member can come to the chamber having approached me in advance and sought permission directly to probe the responsible minister, which is, after all, the essence of the accountability of our political system and specifically of ministers to it. I think also it means that ministers' feet are held to the fire and ministers have to think very carefully about whether, in fact, they should first try to anticipate the likelihood of being summoned and volunteer in any case to come. Actually, we've had both. We've had both a massive increase in UQs and, to be fair, more voluntarily proffered government oral statements. There is a senior minister who has twice in the present government 
challenge beyond this. Ed Balls, he won't mind me saying this, challenged me on this under the Labour government, saying he didn't think the matter concerned was urgent, and he hoped I wouldn't grant it. Ministers get a chance to see the application and to say whether they're thinking about it. And I said to Ed Balls, I was rather surprised to receive a phone call about it. I didn't know that was what ministers were in the habit of doing, phoning the speaker up and, in a sense, trying to browbeat him. And I said to Ed, who's a friend, by the way, and for whom I have a very high regard, well, I will consider the matter, Ed, and I will make an announcement when I'm ready later today. And actually, I thought it did warrant being heard. And Ed, to his credit, came to the chamber and responded to the question, which was about the circumstances of the appointment of the Children's Commissioner. And he never mentioned the matter again and behaved with complete propriety and courtesy. In the present government, there's a senior minister who's twice, in a sense, taken me on on the issue. On the first occasion, he telephoned to say he thought the question wasn't urgent. It was actually from a conservative backbencher. And I said, well, it is for X, Y, Z reasons. And he said, we well, didn't agree. And I said, well, so we will have to agree to differ. And he came and responded to it. On a second occasion, he was obviously seized with indignation. And he wrote me a very substantial letter, virtually, I exaggerate, only a tad, a tome on the subject <laughs> as to why the matter was not urgent and should not have been chosen. And I wrote back to him. I thought, oh, I'm not going to get into a long exchange, which I'm not obliged to do. And so I must admit, ladies and gentlemen, I said to him, I'm extremely grateful to you for taking the time and trouble to write to me and in such detail on this matter, especially in view of the many and burdensome responsibilities which you have taken to shoulder in your high office. However, as you all know, the House has chosen to confer upon me the responsibility for making these judgments, with which, therefore, I feel sure you will rest content. <laughs> and I've not heard from him since on these <laughs> matters. I also said in standing for election, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you can come with me on this issue. I hope I carry your concurrence. Colleagues, there is something faintly absurd, incongruous, and ultimately, if we're serious about this place, candidly unsustainable about the idea that the chairs of the select committees, which are there to scrutinize the executive, are handpicked by members of that very executive. You have chairs of select committees from the government side in the pre-2010 period being chosen by the government whips. And that minority, but significant minority, depending upon the makeup of the House, of select committee chairs taken from the opposition side, chosen by the opposition chief whip. And I said, look, this is a ridiculous situation. I absolutely accept in a modern parliamentary system, members are at least in part elected by virtue of their party, not purely upon their own account or the magnificence of their individual personalities or track records. And so we have to have some sort of discipline and administrative agency for the conduct of business. So I accept that there have to be whips. I've always accepted that, but you know, I think in that sense it's analogous to saying, as I think somebody once did say, that in any modern public health system you need sewers. <laughs> so you obviously need whips, but the important point is that the whips shouldn't get completely above themselves. You, know, you have to confine their responsibilities to a recognisable and limited area. And for my own part, ladies and gentlemen, I should just say to you, for the avoidance of doubt, it's probably fairly obvious to you anyway, that in the 12 years I spent in Parliament before I had the great good fortune and honour to be elected Speaker, I always had a relationship myself, whether I was a backbencher or a front, with the Conservative whips, characterised by trust and understanding. I didn't trust them and they didn't understand me. <laughs> but I said, surely these select committee chairs should be elected by secret ballots of members of the House. And after I was elected Speaker, there was a committee established called the Wright Committee under the chairmanship of the Labour MP at the time for Cannock Chase, Dr. Tony Wright, specifically on the reform of the House of Commons. And it pursued that idea, amongst others, of elected chairs of select committees. They're all now elected. All the main select committees have elected chairs, elected by colleagues, elected by secret ballot of all members of the House. And I would argue that the fact, and I think it is a fact, that the select committees in their 
inquiries and reports are now more assertive, more independent-minded, more penetrating, more insistent than ever before, is not unrelated to, but is at least in part a consequence of, the democratic legitimacy conferred by election. The chairs don't depend on the patronage of the whips. And similarly, the members of those select committees, I argue, should surely be elected on a proportionate basis to reflect the makeup of the House of Commons by their respective party caucuses. And that now happens, and I think it's a great improvement. I said, I think the deputy speakers ought to be elected. They shouldn't be appointed by the parties. They should be the choice of the House. And all three deputy speakers are now the secret ballot, the elected choice of the House of Commons. And that seems to me to be an altogether more satisfactory and democratic arrangement. And I also said back in 2009, I think that whilst recognizing the government should get its business if it's got the votes, the agenda shouldn't be totally dominated by the government of the day. It shouldn't be the exclusive prerogative of the executive to choose what is debated when and for how long. Any chance, I proffer the proposition to my colleagues, that the majority of members in this place who are backbenchers <coughs> might have a say in what is debated when and for how long. And I wasn't the only candidate for the office of speaker to put this proposition, but I think I was first out of the blocks in my campaign, and I did run a campaign which some people thought was extremely undignified, <laughs> never happened before, <laughs> to become speaker. I put that idea on the table. Let us have a, a backbench business committee which chooses the business one day a week. Whether it is the preference of the government or of the opposition front bench, backbenchers can choose what they want to debate, perhaps on the back of e-petitions or other constituency representations or by virtue of activities that they undertake as members of all party groups, which most members of parliament do, let them choose what is to be debated. And what I would argue is that the establishment in 2010 of that backbench business committee, usually known by the nickname BBCOM, is that it has made a transformative difference. Some of the debates taking place under the auspices of the backbench business committee have eventually changed public policy or started the process of such change. Whether the change is beneficial or not is up to you to decide, but there is no doubt that the Backbench Business Committee debate in 2011 on whether there should be a referendum on British membership of the EU, together with other events, shifted David Cameron's mind on that matter. Now, you may like that or not like that, but what I'm saying is it was an effective contributor to the public debate. Similarly, probably the most unforgettable debate under BBCOM auspices so far that I can recall was the debate that took place on the Hillsborough disaster in which there were some quite extraordinarily compelling and inspiring speeches made and that was all about the historic wrong and injustice that was done to the fans in the Hillsborough Stadium who you will recall, ladies and gentlemen, were ritually and in some cases viciously blamed for the tragedy by some representatives of the police service and indeed by the Sun newspaper, which as far as I can tell is scarcely read on Merseyside these days. Now the debate in which two speeches of particular power, those of Steve Rotherham and my friend Alison McGovern, caused the then Home Secretary Theresa May to her great credit to say, yes, this matter needs to be looked at again, and that process is still ongoing. But I think that there is a real prospect, indeed a likelihood, that history will recognize the wrong that was done and will view those events in a different light. We had a debate on mental health, which started the process of parliamentary destigmatization of mental health challenge in which a number of colleagues on both sides of the House spoke openly and movingly about their own challenges. And I think that was an important contribution as one of many to people feeling this subject is something that should be openly broached. So those, I think, have been progressive changes. God knows there are more that could be made. I'd like to see government business scheduled, not behind the scenes, 
by government and opposition whips, but by a House business committee, chaired perhaps by one of the deputy speakers, on which backbenchers would be represented, and that hasn't yet happened. The government was committed to it, and I can only assume that there was a, a moment of forgetfulness that caused the last government to drop that commitment. There are other changes that can be made. I would like to see the insertion in our standing orders of a trigger mechanism for the recall of Parliament. So instead of a recall being dependent purely on a minister, usually the Prime Minister approaching the Speaker and asking whether Parliament should be recalled, there could be a threshold of a cross-party, it would have to be cross-party collection of members who felt that Parliament should be recalled even if the government didn't necessarily think so. That also, in my view, would be worthwhile. I think the way in which we treat private members' bills could usefully be changed. I do not myself believe that it is to the advantage of the reputation of the House that a private member's bill can be talked out on a Friday by the deliberate process of making a very long speech, ordinarily known as filibustering, usually done by very skillful parliamentarians within order but nevertheless done in a way of which a lot of members of the public would disapprove. We could take private members' bills at a different time, have a guaranteed slot for them, and then a vote at the end of the debate, which would seem a more civilised and mature way of approaching these matters. So I'm not suggesting here it would be staggeringly smug and inappropriate that all change that's needed in Parliament has been made. There's a lot still to do. <laughs> and a great deal of my colleagues and I have not accomplished. But if you're one of those people who prefers, as I do, to view the glass as half full rather than half empty, I think we have made significant strides. And that's in the Chamber of Committees. When I stood, I also said, there is that other role of the Speaker as the chair ex officio of the House of Commons Commission, the strategic governing body of the House responsible for its staff, its services, and its property, we are, after all, an employer of 1,750 people, and there are a great many people, many thousands, who are not employed by, but are contracted to work for, or to have a presence on the House of Commons estate. We are a service provider to people there, and we are a World Heritage Site, welcoming approximately one million people a year. So the House of Commons Commission has got important responsibilities. We took the lead in saying, well, Parliament must take a view on restoration and refurbishment, which was done, as you know, yesterday. A difficult and challenging topic about which there were different views and which it would have been wrong for the House of Commons Commission to consider appropriate for its final arbitration, but which was properly put to members at our request. When I stood for election, I said, look, this is 2009, we have a shooting gallery in the House of Commons, which members can go to if they want to do pistol shooting, but we have no nursery, which MPs and staff can pay for if they want to broker and improve work-life balance. And eight years later, I'm pleased to say that we have a nursery which members of parliament and staff could pay for but we no longer have a shooting gallery on the parliamentary estate because it has been closed down in fact the nursery has existed since september 2010. originally i was told by a very high-ranking official who came to see me about it in cut class terms mr speaker it is most admirable sir that you entertain the ambition to establish a nursery in the service of your colleagues and the staff of the house I say, say, I very much admire your spirit upon this matter. However, I'm bound to say to you that unfortunately it will not be possible. And I said, why is that? There's no suitable sight. There's no suitable sight. And he repeated it several times. And I said, I didn't buy that. And he said, well, I tell you what, Mr. Speaker, I do speak with very considerable experience in these matters. I will put together a paper on the matter. And I thought, now I can see what's coming here. This is real Sir Humphrey stuff. I'm going to get a paper saying it's all absolutely hopeless, you can't do anything, please go away and think about something else. So I said, no, 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 no. There are certain sites. I can think of some, perhaps you can. He said, well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Speaker, if any of these events will make you on your plate, I will, if I may, if you can kind enough to allow me to roll the pitch, he said, I will go and look at the terrain, I will look at the sites, and I will come back to you with my report. 
And I said, no, no, I tell you what, we'll go around together. <laughs> By which he looked uh, rather taken aback, disconcerted. But we went round together and we identified possible sites and there were objections to virtually everyone from some people whose real motivation was an utter distaste for the very idea of the establishment of a nursery. There was one colleague who said he very strongly objected to my ultimate choice on the grounds that it would involve the destruction of a bar called Bellamy's. It was Tom Watson, the Labour MP in West Bromwich, who very sensibly said this was complete nonsense as a line of argument, because as he put it, there is no shortage of places on the parliamentary estate where you can get a beer, but there's nowhere you can put a baby. <laughs> now, in the end, we went ahead, there was a degree of background noise, I had people try to cause trouble in all sorts of ways. I was absolutely determined to get that facility, to get the contract signed before the May 2010 election, and then we secured planning permission from Westminster City Council afterwards. It's now a thriving facility. I wanted to establish an education centre in Parliament, and that actually was less difficult, though there were still objections to it. I managed to garner cross-party support on the House of Commons Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, we established a digital, state-of-the-art, interactive education centre adjacent to the House of Lords, because that was the planning advice, which is now allowing us more than to double the number of young people who can come to Parliament to learn about the journey to the rights and representation that we enjoy today. And I'm thrilled about that. And every Monday morning, I also go to the Education Centre, which has got this wonderful programme in quite simple and illustrative terms to show people the progress that the country's made to conduct a Skype session with school students. I visit a lot of schools, but there are always schools that you're not going to be able to visit and which can't come to you. So I have a Skype conversation every Monday with them. And I find that very stimulating and rewarding. And I fail, frankly, to see you know, what objection there can be to it. But there were people who strongly objected, particularly in the House of Lords, to the establishment of the Education Centre principally on NIMBY grounds. They said they weren't against it in principle, and they didn't think it was appropriate for it to be near to the House of Lords. And I had the spouse of a parliamentarian saying to me, in respect of the nursery, that Parliament was a very serious place, and it wasn't appropriate for children to be present. I mean, in my view, that is the very embodiment of reaction. Absolute embodiment of reaction. Why on earth shouldn't we have children enlivening the place, taking an interest in the place, gaining something from their experience of seeing the place? I think the House needs to look and sound and be a bit more like the country we aspire to represent, and we've still got a long way to go, but I've sought advice from specialist recruitment consultants to help us make the staff profile of the House more diverse, more inclusive, more representative of modern Britain. I appointed the first female and the first BME speaker's chaplain in the history of the House of Commons. The Telegraph made a row about it at the time. But I was very proud of the choice I made. The Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, and there was a programme about her on television, which some of you might have seen recently, is a wonderfully empathetic person. She's a fantastic chaplain. And she provides terrific moral and pastoral support to people throughout the House, not just members, but staff and those who work in other capacities on the estate. I appointed the first female and BME Speaker's Council, senior lawyer to the Speaker and to the House, in the history of the House. It had always previously been a white male. She was appointed on merit, and Sarah Salibi is a fantastic Speaker's Council. And I appointed the first, and it was for me to do, the first BME Sergeant at Arms in the history of the House of Commons, Mohammed, usually known as Kamal, al Haji, who is doing a fantastic job. I mean, we've got a great deal more to do, but we are starting to break down some of those barriers. And I'm delighted to know now that there are a lot of people coming to the House who wouldn't have thought of doing so before. And I think I'm right in saying that there are either in this room or in one of the adjoining rooms, young people from South Shields coming tonight from the Key Project, people who had never had a chance to visit Parliament before. And they had the opportunity at the back end of last year. And I'm told by Emma Lewell Buck, the constituency member of Parliament, that they loved the visit. They'd never taken an interest in Parliament. They didn't really know much about it. And um, apparently they decided to come along this evening. And this is what we want to be doing, reaching out 
as I did, I think, with Chi in the first meeting I attended in her tenure as Member of Parliament in Newcastle, when we had a meeting with, frankly, a group of people that you would call hard to reach, people with very great troubles and challenges in their lives. And a lot of them probably thought we were very odd and had some explaining to do, but it was a good, almost a cathartic exchange. My final point to you is this, ladies and gentlemen. When I stood for election, I said, look, I'll do the duties of the speaker to the best of my ability. Chairing the chamber, chairing the House of Commons Commission, meeting and greeting visitors from across the country and around the world. But if you are with me, I would like to add one further function, and that is the speaker, whilst retaining the traditional and valued impartiality of the chair, should strive to be an ambassador for Parliament and a robust advocate of democratic politics, who gets out beyond the parliamentary estate to talk to, engage with, and hear from other people in civil society. So if you elect me, I will visit schools, I'll visit colleges, I'll visit public bodies, I'll visit faith groups, I'll visit charitable institutions of one kind or another to talk about the role of the speaker and the functioning of parliament, the importance of democracy, why it all matters, how you can get involved, in what way we're changing. And when I put this proposition in the competitive speaker election of 2009, one of my senior colleagues, who has since been elevated, ladies and gentlemen, to a higher place, and referring not to heaven, but to the House of Lords, <laughs> said, and I scarcely exaggerate, I am bound to say, colleagues, that I have listened to the argument, the thesis of my honourable friend, the member for Buckingham, and on the strength of my well-nigh 40 years' service in this House, I have to say, in all charity to my honourable friend, whose good intentions I don't doubt, but whose judgment I assuredly do, <laughs> that if he is successful in his quest to attain the great office of speaker, after which, as you know, colleagues, I myself continue to hanker hence my candidature in this election. And he proceeds in the manner that he has articulated in recent times to take to the public square quite an old-fashioned expression, and to opine on a vast facility of controversial topics, as he doubtless intends, the consequences for Parliament will be profoundly injurious. And I said, well, Patrick, if I had been advocating such an approach, you would be justified in criticising me, but I was not, and therefore you are not. I'm not suggesting the Speaker should go declaiming about Conservative or Labour economic policy or education policy or health policy, the Speaker absolutely shouldn't do that. All I'm saying is the Speaker should get out there a bit and talk to people and hear from them. Rather than dressing up in a fancy uniform, being almost completely inaccessible to the outside world and deriving comfort from the fact of the occupancy of the office, the Speaker should be a public engagement practitioner or communicator. And that is what I have sought to do. Internally, practicing, I know it's a rather ugly and inelegant term, ladies and gentlemen, in-reach, and externally, practicing outreach. Internally, it means welcoming people in to Speaker's House, hosting charitable functions for great causes in our voluntary sector and sometimes our national and international lives. It means chairing the Youth Parliament every year. I've chaired the Youth Parliament session every year since 2009 on a non-sitting Friday when the Chamber wouldn't otherwise be used. Now, why do I do that? Well, I do that, of course, because I enjoy it, but I do that, ladies and gentlemen, if I may say so, because I think that if Chi and I and other parliamentarians want ever again, and it's a long-term process of recovery and reconstruction, to be respected by young people, we must show some respect for young people. Respect is not our automatic right. It is an earned credit or a worked-for entitlement, if you will. And so that's why I chair that session every year. And that's why every year I go to the UK Youth Parliament Conference, wherever it takes place in the UK, on the assumption, of course, that they want me to go, which thus far, fortunately for me, they have always done so. But I try to get out to schools and universities and other groups because I think that that's what the Speaker should do. Six months into my term of office, a very senior colleague, I'm not saying whether he's still in the House or not, came up to me at the chair and he said to me, he was extraordinarily hesitant that day and rather inarticulate. He said to me, Mr. Speaker, sir, 
I didn't vote for you. Now, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't need to be either Ethel Poirot or Sherlock Holmes to have worked this out for myself. For a variety of reasons with which I will not belabor you, there is no way in a million years this chap would have voted for me to be speaker. But anyway, he felt it necessary to say this. So, Mr. Speaker, I didn't vote for you. I voted for Sir George Young because I think he's a bloody good egg. <laughs> but I'm bound to say, I think we're doing frightfully well, if I may say so. We're setting up the rights of backbench members, summoning uh, these uh, wretched ministers who come to the House and answer questions and so forth. That's right. Well done. Well done. But I just want to make my point. Can I make my point? Because I just to make my point. <laughs> is what I need to say is this. I mean, I, I think this outreach business, you know, of you sort of, well, you know, visiting schools and, 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 uh, and, and colleges and, 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 and universities and so on. Well, I'm just a thinker. So, I'm about to say, I think it's uh, I think it's rather a rum business. Rum business. Uh, any of you here, who here has ever read P.G. Woodhouse? <laughs> There's a word P.G. Woodhouse used. Rum, meaning strange, inexplicable. I think it's a rather rum business. I said, I don't know what you mean, what you mean is rum. He said, well, I mean, I speak with very considerable experience. My family, we've been long established connections with this place. I said, no, no, I completely understand that. I'm just trying to fathom your, basically, you know, what's your argument? And he said, well, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, he said, I think he's rather below stairs. <laughs> below stairs, he said. It's a very snobbish expression <laughs> where the servants are. He said, I think he's rather below stairs. I'm mean, quite honest. If people want to know what the Speaker does, they bloody well come to the House of Commons and listen to the Speaker of Birth. But I mean, the idea of the Speaker, sir, in your exalted office, which you have attained democratically, and uh, I respect the idea that you, as Speaker, will be trogging around the country going to our wretched village hall. Or some school. <laughs> he said, you know, I, I, I bound to say, I think it is beneath the dignity of the office. And I said, I completely disagree. I've always remembered this conversation. I said, I absolutely respect you saying so to me candidly, if that's your opinion. But I completely disagree with you. We are in a different world. And we've got to wake up to our responsibility. And I am determined to get out there and communicate with people and hear from them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my pitch. That is what I have sort of am seeking and will seek to do. My final remark is just this. I wish for the young people here present the opportunity, the privilege to do for a living what you enjoy for its own sake. It's incredibly important. I know it's a statement, perhaps, of the obvious, but it's incredibly important. If you're thinking about what to do at university, choose the subject you enjoy most. You want to go on to do for a living that which causes you to leap out of bed in the morning with excitement and anticipation and a sense of mission or inquiry and challenge. Because you spend at least a third of your life at work until you retire or die. So, of course, you want to make a good living. I'm very lucky to do so. But what I love about my job as a Member of Parliament and as Speaker is that I regard it as a huge privilege, great fun, and a continuing challenge. I have absolutely no plans whatsoever to die tomorrow. <laughs> but if I were to die tomorrow, I would die happy, feeling that I have been very lucky. Now, on the strength of my presentation, and notwithstanding the quite extraordinary display of courtesy, forbearance, and stoicism that you have volunteered to me, I know now, for sure, that even if your courtesy prevents you saying so, ladies and gentlemen, from the Vice-Chancellor and the local Member of Parliament downwards, you will be relieved beyond words to know that my lecture is definitively at an end. Thank you very much.